Hello and welcome back to Awakened Soul Stories. Uh, we have a wonderful evening planned for you. We have a great guest. Um, I'm going to say her name in English. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's Kirsten Zetmar. Uh, she came all the way from Newport, Rhode Island. Um, and she has a, a, a quite the variety of talents. Uh, aside from being an artist, uh, and we're surrounded by her artwork tonight, which she will be talking about. Um, so I'm going to let Mike take over for a minute, and then we'll get into the... Uh... Mike has really nothing on his paper today. <laughs> um, we'll just I've wing got it. my name, and it's, and it's blank, so uh, I guess I'm going to have to wing it. By the way, today is episode 11. Yeah. Ah. So those of you with angel numbers out there, right? One, one. One of my favorite numbers. One, one. So there you yeah. have it. Like um, it. You know, no shout outs today. Um, other than to my mom, look, I took today off. <laughs> uh, my mom cut me some slack yesterday for Mother's Day, <laughs> knowing that I worked the weekend. So had an amazing day today. Had lunch with my mom and we did some fun stuff afterwards. And it was a spectacular day. It was nice to get out with just her and I today. Um, I don't see her very often. I do talk to her quite frequently, but it was nice to uh, to get out and spend some time with my mom. Mikey. <laughs> uh, yeah, only a couple of people call me that. So. Um, Carol, if you're watching. <laughs> right, Carol. So, you know, not a lot to say other than what have you done for yourself this week? We're, we're dying to know exactly um, what some of you folks have done or started out there in the way of whether it's yoga, prayer, meditation. We want to know what gets you through these crazy days out there. Mm -hmm. um, maybe someone else could benefit from that. So it's, it's really important. And this is why we started this show again, to shine the light on people that have gifts, talents. We're all gifted. And I think, and I think the thing to do is to be able to discover what brings you joy. We were just having a conversation prior to the show starting, you know, um, on how Kirsten, you know, knew what brought her passion, um, what she was passionate about, and what brought her joy, and she tried to turn that into earning a living. And so, yeah. for most of you out there, you know, in the nine to five job, um, you know, there are ways to discover your passion, and, you know, we try to bring that to you. Right. So, you know. Do you find it? It's out there. You have to look for it. You have to do your homework. Remember, folks, it's an inside job. Exactly. Right? If, I mean, I could never, what I do now to make a living, if I would have gone to some guidance counselor in school where they would try to, you know, tell me what I should do, what was suitable for me, they would never have been able to come up with this because... Because <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. No. I mean, if n nobody knew that you could make a living doing something called the Rosen Method and massage and uh, past life regressions and, you know, that would never have come up. So I had to kind of go really to listen to my own body, what got me excited, what got me enthusiastic. And first, um, it seemed to always be like I did it for me, and then I got excited and wanted to share it with other people, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how, how it's come to be, all those different things. And it, and it comes back to being of service. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So we talk about that all the time on this show, about it doesn't really matter what you're doing, if it's bringing you joy, um, and you're being of service to someone else. Right, and um, yourself. Yeah. You know, that's important. Yeah, mm -hmm. and if it, the joy factor, I think, is, is underrated, how important that is. You know, it's like I've found so many times that I've, whenever I've tried to do a workshop and say, oh, I should do a workshop on that, any shoulds doesn't bring people in because they can kind of feel it that it's a should, you know. On the other hand, if it's something like, oh my God, this is so exciting, and I'm like beaming about it, people get intrigued. It's like, really? <laughs> oh, when was that you said, you know? So like joy is, and enthusiasm is so important. 
And, and I couldn't agree more. And as a matter of fact, I shared a couple of stories. And of course, I have nothing written down, but it's, it's, all, yeah. it's all coming That's back why. to me. I have a couple of quick stories and, and about that I shared with Pam over the last week and myself dealing with customers, clients, uh, you know, or potential clients. And, you know, after speaking with a husband and wife, you know, I just say, hey, look, if you, if you would like the service, then just give me a call. I wasn't a mile down the road, and the husband was calling me and said, um, yeah, could you pencil us in whenever you wow. can do it? Um, you want us over with your personality. And, and yeah. so I had a conversation with him, and I said, well, uh, you know, the previous uh, person that I was speaking with about another prospective job um, made a comment to me and said, Oh my God, I can see the passion yeah. when you talk about what it is you do. Right, exactly. And, and I explained that to the guy. I said, well, I'm not so sure it's my personality, but it's certainly <laughs> perhaps the passion, yeah. uh, you know, that I explain things because it's what I do and, and, and I enjoy doing it. That's and right. people, like you just said, they pick up on that. Yeah. Oh, they yeah. feel that energy. Because it's all energy. We are, we are energetic beings, you know, and I've been asked now for probably 25 years at least to go into Salva Regina University a couple of times a year to their classes and talk about the Rosen Method Body Soul work that I do in the Body Awareness class for the Master's Program of Holistic Health. And when I first was asked, I was always so nervous. I wrote down everything I wanted to say. I wanted to get it perfect. And, and I kept doing it that way until I managed to lock my massage table and all my material in my car. And <laughs> there was not enough time to fiddle with that. So I just had to run to Salve and show up without anything else. But I, I had to wing it and forget my notes and everything else. But that was one of the better ones, and I learned that, you know, it's, if it's all too rehearsed, it doesn't carry energy. And many times after that, so that's when I stopped bringing notes or anything, and after that, when people have called and said, oh, I want to come in and try the Rosen method, um, I always was curious, you know, first, like, what was it that I said? What was that line that got you to say yes right. to this, right? And more often than not, they didn't have an answer for that. They just said, well, it was your energy. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know, here I'd been trying to phrase it right and all that, and that can be important in educational um, situations particularly. But, but we do, I think, tend to remember how we felt when we were with someone. We might not remember exactly what that they said, but we do remember how we felt in their presence. So, And, and you've heard that before here yeah. on another episode, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's something that, that it's comes universal. up. It yeah. is universal. And, and so, look, in the studio, it looks different, right? We have beautiful paintings done here, and we have some other artwork with incredible detail um, and we're going to get to that in a little while and there's a photo of it right there oh yeah called uh, that i call that one coming together um, in many of my pieces people have pointed out it's not by design or consciously but in many of my pieces it seems to be something moving towards a light or moving in towards something and in that particular one coming together, I wanted to show that people can come from different directions, you know, like there's some people coming that way, over that way, that way. It all leads to the same place, you know. And so my question would be, what moved you? What was the impetus to create that particular that one? That particular one. Well, I created it. It was actually a number. That's one of my older pieces. I, I forgot exactly what year it was, but I was asked to um, come up with an image for a global congress for the Rosen Method that was going to be held in New York State. And uh, they wanted an image they could put on T-shirts and on name tags and flyers and all these kind of things. Um, and since there were people coming from all over the world for that, that kind of got me to think like we're all coming together. But it can be taken in a broader sense too. 
And that particular image, many people have actually used for their own workshops, for their own organizations. There's an organization in Atlanta, Georgia, um, peaceful cities or whatever, and they asked if they could use that. So it's been used a lot um, and for different purposes. So I'm, I'm very curious as to the actual process uh, organically, if you will, yeah. um, while you're sitting at your easel or, or do you have a moment where you're doing something else and this all of a sudden pops in into your mind uh, how you want to create it? It's a good question. Um, I prefer to kind of go in with um, like a basic sense of what I want, but not all the details before the execution. So I start doing things and then I might, something might even happen by accident. It's like, oh, I didn't mean that, but you know what? It kind of works and then I go with that and and it kind of evolves as I'm doing it more often than not. And so that's exciting for me too, because if I had it all figured out and knew exactly where everything was gonna go, it would be like paint by numbers for me and I, it would not be so exciting. I'm not poo-pooing on paint by numbers. I know people do that and some people love it and it's very therapeutic, but, but this, when I do um, pieces like that that are not all figured out, it does something. It brings me into like a slightly altered state, actually. And I think that's true for all creative people. Okay. And, and I think we all benefit from going into that state, whether it's in your garden, you know, gardening, and oh my God, I've been out here four hours. I thought it was one hour. You know, right. all that is so good for us. And I love that state where you have no clue what time it is or how much time has passed. And, and uh, creating images is one way to get there for me. Yeah, and and uh, athletes, professional athletes call that the zone, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, they're in that altered state of consciousness. Look at this particular one right yeah. here. This is absolutely stunning. Oh, thank you, the three muses. Yeah, that one was, um, I was actually asked to paint while people were watching, which is um, not exactly my favorite thing, but I agreed to do it. <laughs> At, um, at a fair, like a spiritual, holistic fair. So I was painting and making it up as I went while people were watching. Problem with that is that sometimes people can go like, hey, what is that or why is that? You know, <laughs> and it kind of breaks that trance, right? But um, I finished it at home after when I brought it home. But in, in, a, in a piece like that, I mean, what, what kind of time frame? I mean, how long, you know, do you well, let I, it simmer I, a little bit? And yeah, I got the basics down because mm -hmm. I had that day at the fair. So I was, it was certain hours and I wanted it to look somewhat done by the end. But since, the, after, since then, I took it home and I, I tweaked it a bit. And, you know, it helps, helps to step back and look at it with fresh eyes. And go, oh, I see exactly what needs to happen here because you tend to get so close to it. You can't see the forest for the trees and you don't, right. you don't know. And if there's something a little bit that irks you, it's like, oh, I don't know about that. That's all you see. You don't see the whole picture, <laughs> right? What you're creating. Yeah, so sometimes if you get like stuck, I find it's best to put it away, maybe start another piece, come back to it fresh, and you go, oh, of course, duh. This is what it needs, so. <laughs> so, so do you have a bunch of uh, Unfinished work. There, there are in few. The works there are few. Yeah. I like to finish things. I, I don't like to have tons of unfinished things, but sometimes I do have a few and uh, go back and say, hey, you know, it, it helps to actually look at it as if somebody else had done it, not me. And that's when it's lovely when you hang stuff in a gallery or in somebody else's environment. It's easier to do that. You kind of go, oh, that one is actually pretty cool, you know, or <laughs> <laughs> as if somebody else had done it, you know, you have a little more distance to it that way. Do you think you're your own worst <coughs> critic? I think we all are. <laughs> I think we all are. Um, and it's, it's tricky when you have, um, when I have, I think many artists would agree with that, when you've just finished a piece, if they say, are you happy with it? Do you like it? I don't know yet. It's too soon. So it's, it's not really, for me, a very good idea trying to finish something and then 
hand it over, you know, to a show or something right away because I might very well come in to the show a week later and go, oh, no, 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 that doesn't work. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> they need to mature a little bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they have to cure, as yes, they say. Yes, right? exactly. <laughs> so what is, what is your preferred medium that you like to work within? I go between, um, I, well, my, what most people know me for is the fiber art that I do, actually. Um, I happen to like textures a lot. And um, playing with textures, and especially if, when I can work large, I can make like a little bit of a relief effect there with some very thick yarns and some shiny and kind of play with it that way. So, but those take a long time. So I go between that and painting and oil and acrylics. Any so. watercolor? No, I did some in school, you know, and, um, but I, I never really took to it too much. Probably because I, I don't know what I'm gonna paint when I start and you muddy it up so easily with watercolor. It's like, oh no, not that, no, <laughs> not no. It, you kind of gotta know where you're going with it. That's so true. Mm. Now, do I, you feel like that you, uh, do you, do you <coughs> channel some of these paintings? Well, people have told me that when they look at it. And um, I, th I do think that I get inspiration when I go into that sp state, um, a creative state. I think you're more in tune in some way so that inspiration can come through in that way. <coughs> your third eye a bit, huh? Yeah. <laughs> when I <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to take a drink here. Um, when I was young in Sweden, I would go out in the woods and paint. And um, if I was there through most of the day and there were no distractions, I would, I would go into an altered state and I would sometimes hear voices and I wouldn't tell many people that. They would call the white coats on you yeah. if you did that. <laughs> <laughs> but I would hear voices, but it wasn't like scary voices or anything. It was almost like as if a radio had been turned on. And there were these characters, you know, and I could listen in. But when, when it first happened, when I was in my 20s, I would be like, oh, and I would try to listen in, and then they disappeared, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but then when I was 40, um, I took three months off my regular life to go be an art hermit in Nantucket. And, um, and so I d had a lot of uninterrupted times again where I could just go for it. And, and I learned to actually listen and not, not stop it by paying attention to it. Um, so it felt like dreams, you know, more I would say, kind of like a dream state even though I was awake. That's kind of a <laughs> Yes, I know that feeling. You know that feeling, <laughs> yeah, I bet you feeling. do. You probably have even more of, of all that than I do. Oh, but no, but I understand it perfectly. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, and what about when you do the, um, talk a little bit about your uh, past life regression work. Yeah, the past life regression, I was, I've always been fascinated by past lives, or I shouldn't say always, but I had strange dreams as a kid of um, nuns and monks. And in Sweden, there, there weren't many monks and nuns. Sweden is very Protestant. So um, that was kind of strange to me that I would have a lot of dreams like that, right? Um, and then I had dreams that kind of guided me. And so I was, I was curious. And then when, I guess it was 1990, my, um, my mother gave me the book, Many Lives, Many Masters by Brian, Brian Weiss. Weiss. Yeah. So I read that, and um, and again, I'd been very fascinated and read things I could get my hands on since I was about 15, um, oh, yeah, when it came to past lives. And um, so he opened up things, of course. Um, but little did I know that many years later, I would actually be able to train with him, you know, at Omega and take a wow. seminar to get certified by him in doing it. Fantastic. Yeah. That's amazing. What an opportunity. Yeah. And, uh, and he's such a kind, kind soul. Oh my. He's, he's the sweetest, kindest, and he has this funny, dry sense of humor. I, I just really enjoyed it. So since then, uh, I've been conducting past lives with 
individuals, privates, and with groups. Um, and now during COVID, I um, couldn't gather groups in the same way that I used to. Um, so I've been starting to do them on Zoom and surprisingly it works quite well on Zoom too. And the fun thing with that is that people who, um, who are in other countries have been able to, to come on and do it with me. Um, I, it was one time I had a woman from Germany, one from Spain, one from Canada, all on the same call. So that's oh, pretty wow. cool. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's yeah. global right there. Yeah, it's yeah. Kind touching of, it's a lot got, of people. It's, it's fun. And, um, and there are people who tell me that they've had healings from it, which really, you know, I don't, I don't tell anybody what they are or what they were. I guide them into that trans state that I love so much and have them go through there and I ask questions that they trust whatever comes to them. You know, first, yep. first thought, always go with first thought. Don't argue with yourself, don't analyze in the middle of it, just go with it. You can always analyze later afterwards, but um, yeah, people have had some pretty exciting results from there. Wow. Any, so. any good Juicy stories you'd like uh, to share with well, us? Well, yeah, I can <laughs> share one. Uh, Juicy. This, yes, there was one, uh, uh, one person who came in, actually the very first person who wanted me to do this uh, with him uh, was a military man in Newport. So I've learned to not have preconceived notions of who's open to this and not, you know, mm -mm. because uh, <laughs> who would have thought a Navy guy would be the first right. one to sign up. But he was so eager, he, he called me. He's like, you said you were gonna go for that training. Did you do it yet? Oh, oh yeah, I came back, <laughs> last, came back last week. Oh, can I come in? So I was like, uh, yes. Of course, I'm all nervous still. Uh, am I doing it right and all that? And uh, he said, I'm a little nervous. Could I have half hour massage first? Because he, he was a massage client of mine, so that's how he knew me. So he said, I think that would help me relax. I'm like, yeah, sure. So I massaged him. I said, so what are you nervous about? And he said, well, if the people like my parents and my wife knew I was here, they would be so worried about me. And I said, they would? What would they be worried about? <laughs> and he said, oh, that I've fallen off, you know, the, the right path and all this stuff. And, and uh, he said, I'm Catholic, but I am open to this. And, and it shouldn't really necessarily have to be a conflict, right? Sure. Yeah. And I said, no, I don't see any conflict that way. But the interesting thing was when I led him through afterwards, he decided he wanted to sit up for it so he wouldn't fall asleep. And um, when I led him through, the first person that came through with the first image, he said he saw Jesus. And Jesus was standing in the water and guiding him, come, come. And then he said, it's totally okay. So I don't know if that was like something he needed to go on. And then he, he went and had an experience of, I forgot exactly what it was now, but it was like um, something in the Roman times or something like that. Right? Like a gladiator? Yeah, some, <laughs> something. something like that. Um, and uh, so that was fascinating to me. And, and it just kind of... It just flowed out of him. I didn't even have to ask much. It was like he channeled, you know, he just wow. blah, 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 It was just. He was ready. Yeah, he was so ready. ready. And uh, I had another guy come in after, and uh, he recalled a lifetime as a Native American young woman, uh, very petite, and he, he got so much detail. And here's this big burly Irish guy, right? And he's describing himself as this Native American. And uh, he told a tale about um, her having to flee from her village because there was a, they were fighting and, and uh, she was the daughter of the chief, I think. So she was, he, they got news that somebody was gonna try to take her. So she had to leave in the middle of the night without saying goodbye to her mother. And there was this grief that she carried for the rest of her life. And, um, and then when I brought him out of that and out of that body and, you know, out of watching it and going towards the light and being met by other guides, et cetera, light beings, he's, he's like, oh, but she's fine. You know, this is so peaceful. She's I don't have to worry about her anymore. And afterwards he told me he had all his life, as long as he could remember, he had woken up with this 
inexplicable grief every morning that he just had to plow through to get going. And he had been in therapy and uncovered things from his childhood, but the grief was still there. And, and then he had said to his, um, to his therapist, like, I don't know what, I had this thought the other day, he said that maybe this grief isn't mine. I don't know what to do with that thought. And she said, maybe you should go see Sheston because <laughs> he was, um, his therapist was a massage client of mine. So he came in. And after that experience, uh, just one session of recalling that and feeling that she was at peace, he could let go of that. And he came in two weeks later, he wanted to try it again. He said, would you believe I have not had that grief? Oh, and, wow. and part of me was like, wow, that's nice. I wonder how long that's gonna last. You know, like that, I'm very open-minded, but there's always a little skeptic sure. in on my jury about things. and. You know, I like what um, Joan Borisenko says, uh, you know, keep your mind open, don't let your mind fall out, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking, you know, maybe this will last for a bit, but I saw him three years later and it was still holding. Well, that's fascinating. Wow. Well, I guess once you let it go, it's yeah, gone. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, so uh, you know, maybe explain just a little bit about you know, the process. Is this something that, you know, someone could, is it a one session thing or, or how does varies. that work? It varies. There's some people who um, Brian Weiss would call past life tourists, right? They don't come in for any particular issue. They just want to see if they can do it, if they can get anything. And for some of those people, once is enough just to see, you know. But generally, the more you do it, the better you get it at tuning into that station in a way, just watching, allowing the images. So what happens is somebody comes in and I like to talk to them a little bit first before we get them on the massage table or in a chair, just to establish contact. And <coughs> that way they get a chance to sniff me out and I get a chance to hear what they're about, what what concerns they might have, if they've had <coughs> any, any patterns in their life that tend to repeat, mm -hmm. um, if they have any anything that seem like a bleed, bleed over that I call from another lifetime, like, um, you know, f fears, phobias, or strong attractions, aversions, or um, gifts that they seem to have come in with, all those kind of things. So I think that I initially, when I first started this 2013, I kind of got into it right away, but I think that part of talking is actually important first to, because in order to let go to the extent that it requires, you need to feel safe. So just to come in and see a person they've never seen before, why should they feel safe sure. with me right away? So that that's a piece <coughs> of it. And then we get them on the massage table, or if they are the type of person who falls asleep on a dime, I have them sit up <laughs> so they don't uh, miss th it. That would be me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I usually do like a progressive relaxation with them first and then some deepening exercises and some just keep bringing them deeper and then eventually step off, off there and ask what they're aware of, what they're seeing, what they're feeling, who else is there, where in the world they might be, that kind of thing. And when I do the individual one-on-one, -on -one, um, they actually can talk back to me so I can do follow-up questions and stuff. Some people prefer not to talk and just have me ask the questions and they'll tell me after and that's, that's fine too. But when they do talk, I can get a little bit more in there and, and say, well, what was, cost, what, what was it behind that that you felt that way or you know, get more information.